What are your qualifications? Ah, well, I attended Juilliard. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. I travel quite extensively. I lived through the Black Plague, and I had a pretty good time during that. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it. Not to mention the fact that you're talking to a dead guy. Now, what do you think? You think I'm qualified? We're picking your nose, Clark. Let's go. Look alive. Coming to you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, now is the time where myself and Jim are going to speak. Da da da. Well, did Jim just say myself and Jim? Yes. Are about to speak. If you are trying to catch up with what that story is, that was, I believe, our first episode, and I wasn't sure how to start the episode, and he. Gave a spiel of that. That's how we should do it. So He was I, giving you a line reading in the film business that's known as a line reading. Say this, Braden. Exactly. So I thought yeah. it was really clever, so I cut it. And the mysterious voice that nobody knows but has heard the name very many times is my new special co-host for this, for this uh, week is Dave Stevens. Dave, thank you for filling in today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've heard that this is an amazing time. Well, you've been name dropped uh, many times. So Excellent. I would hope that that you uh, uh, you would make an appearance eventually. So right, I'm happy to be here. I I do enjoy the show, so I'm gonna do my best not to be too good at this because I like listening to you and Jim. So <laughs> I appreciate it. And you know, then, if I'm too amazing, then you're just gonna have to find a, a replacement for me, probably. There you go. Um, and we've got the cameras. Someone's got to let us in the building, though. I think it's true. That's that's my that's my one thing to keep me around. <laughs> Um, also in the producer studio, she's getting the cameras working is Emily. Emily's working really hard and, but not to beat around the bush. We have a very, very special guest who is currently on the phone with us in the middle of classes. Uh, Darren Dalton. He's in the, he's about to teach the youngsters in Hollywood is what he's about to do. He's, he's putting their education on hold for our listeners, (laughs) for our entertainment. Darren, thank you so much. Hey, glad to be here. Glad to be here. Well, you know, it's, Listen, if David does well or he doesn't do well, there's only about like 14 more Evans <laughs> brothers to fill in, so you're fine. You're going to be okay. Well, I've ran through two already, so he's the third. <laughs> then Nate's my last, my last, uh, my last card. So, Man, I, can't... I love, I love them all. Well, Mike D, Mike D's no slouch. You know, that's, I mean, the whole, the whole gang, the whole gang is very entertaining. We we're truly blessed to have quite yeah. theatrical family members in my family. That's definitely true. I don't know what happened to me. I have two feet when it comes to uh, two left it's feet. Just when it's a generation. Exactly. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know. Exactly. Well, you got the handsome gene. <laughs> I appreciate you, it. You've got an education. Well, every, everybody tells me that I look like Dave, so hopefully that's so, a good thing. So there you go. Let's keep going down that line of thought. But for those, those people that are roughly a younger demographic who don't know who our, who our caller is right now, Darren Dalton, he is an he's a, he's a actor that... Had kind of his blow up career in red. He's red, a hyphenate, is, is is what he is. A hyphenate <laughs> means he does too many important things to just call him one thing. He's okay. an actor. He's a director. He's a screenwriter. He's a film director. He's an educator. He's a teacher. Uh, he's Whoa. a novelist. The novelist. He has wow. a, he's a comedian. I'm about to add that hyphenate. That's right. <laughs> you are a novelist. The the yeah. two movies. Uh, we had our viewers watch Darren. Actually, is we wa- had them all watch The Outsiders and Red Dawn, both of them, the right. the remake and and yours back in 1984. And so, right. ho- hopefully, our our viewers paid attention, did their homework, and uh, know a little bit about uh, about your movies when we get into them in a little right. bit. It was right after they started becoming talkies. <laughs> so long ago, it was right after we, you know, the, the silent film era was followed by. The Outsiders and Red Dawn. That's right. No, it's uh. So they watched the new Red Dawn as well. Yes, that was the that was they, the homework never assignment. Get that time back. You do realize <laughs> they're never going to get that time back. So uh, well, I'll admit, <laughs> Dar- Darren just said we'll never get that time back. Those who watched it. The funny thing is, is I was asked to. You want that close? Yes, close please. It. Sorry, we had the door remained uh, open. Okay, Very cool. Sorry, pro- professionalism at its height. It's finest. <laughs> Sorry there. So I was, te- I, I was asked as the guest uh, host, the, the uh, temporary, to, to watch 
the Outsiders again, to watch Red Dawn again, to, to watch Red Dawn remake for the first time, and to go watch John Wick number three. And I've got to say, am I, am, is wow. it okay to say that? Of course, yeah. I don't know how people watch that many movies <laughs> in a short period of time, but I couldn't do it. it I couldn't was, get, I, I, I picked one not to watch. Yeah. I ran out of time, and me, it was the remake. So. Yeah, me, me too. I've seen oh. the remake, so I wasn't able to rewatch it, but I did. Um, so I know what about it. So we're going to still kind of dabble into it a little bit. But that's funny because Jim, on the other hand, he watches everything. So that was kind of the idea. And slowly as we've gotten deeper into more movies and get, been able to fortunately go to screenings has kind of been right. just so many time, uh, so much time. And joining us in studio as my sister takes her place in the producer room, Tammy's in. Tammy just got here. So thank you for showing up, Tammy. You're welcome. Hello. And uh, Darren, this is my little sister, Tammy. So... Hi, Dambi. Oh, hello. It's another human in here. <laughs> it's, a, or, it's our conscience. Usually it's the conscience right. of another human that I can't He's see. calling live from Hollyweird. Exactly. Oh. So, wow. Darren. Can I ask the first question? Yes. Dave was going to ask you. Sure. I was going to pitch to Dave. There's, there's a, this is why they're not going to keep me around, Darren, is <laughs> butt my way up in front. No, I want to I'm pretty it. used to it at this point, so go ahead. <laughs> um, a lot of, I think the question I'm about to ask you would appeal to any listener uh, but but specifically from what I am told, the the audience of this show, since it's a you know a movie talk show, right? the uh, The idea of being discovered, being right. a young man in Wyoming, and right. Francis Ford Doppola shows up in your town <laughs> looking for talent. What is that like? Right. That. Uh, well, I mean, first off, I had just moved a couple of years prior from Wyoming to New Mexico, which is kind of like, you know, it's a step up, but not really <laughs> that big a step, you know, but, uh, um, but this is what happened. A couple of my friends, I was going to, to high school. I was actually in a performing arts high school. I, uh, I, I had done a little bit of acting, but I was really there because I loved building sets and things like that. And then uh, a couple of my friends, because I had a car, asked me if I would maybe give them a ride. And to, to an audition at the Hilton downtown. And I had no idea what it was for. And so I, I said, sure, whatever, because uh, I'm going to push over that way. And uh, I, I, I drove them to the audition. And as I'm sitting in the hallway waiting for them to, to, to Uber them back, basically, the uh, Janet Hershenson, the, uh, the uh, casting director for it, uh, and for a lot of films, a lot of Ron Howard's films, a lot of, a lot of uh, Coppola's films, uh, said, you, you should... You know, you should come in as well. And I, I was like, okay. I didn't have any pictures. I didn't have any, a resume or anything like that with me. So I wrote a resume out on, on uh, you know, lined notebook paper and tore it out. And, and they stapled a Polaroid on there. And, uh, you know, the next day I got a call. And, you know, I got a call back. There, there are there are hundreds of professional photographers right now going, no, no, <laughs> don't tell them that. Like, no. I, I, I still use a Polaroid to this day. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it was just, it was just one of those classic right place at the right time. But, but, uh, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I went to a couple of callbacks there in town. They were going, they were, they, they were doing a, a nationwide kind of talent search, looking for people to be in the movie. And, uh, uh, I, I auditioned for them in Albuquerque a couple of times. We did some imp improvising and things like that. I, I didn't meet Coppola at that time, but the guy that I did meet, who was really the the, the mastermind behind that uh, fantastic cast, was Fred Roos, who produced a lot of Francis's stuff and and was just really had a great eye for talent. I mean, he he put together the the group that did The Godfather and and uh, you know, and if you look at the cast of The Outsiders, it's just pretty much pretty off the hook. So. But uh, so I, I talked to them. I went back to my normal high school life at that time. And then uh, and then I got a call a little bit later to come out to L.A. And uh, they flew me out to L.A. And it was it was a, a much different audition process than what you'd normally expect, uh, certainly than what I, I, I realized was the, the norm, uh, because he would have us all, all the kids in, you know, all these all these guys in a. In, in a, a big sound stage, and then he would just kind of Francis would just kind of point at people and say, "Okay, you're going to be this person, and you're going to be that person, and maybe you'd read from the script, maybe you'd improvise, you know." But then, you know, pizza would come in, and you'd eat pizza, and and uh, 
it was just a it was it was a great experience. I never read the role I I, I ultimately ended up with, and uh, um, I went out to I came out to California a couple of times. I I, I went to uh, New York uh, for the final audition. So it was a real it, it was that it fit that kind of like picture perfect you know being discovered thing. I mean I wasn't I wasn't at this soda fountain you know counter exactly, but I was awfully <laughs> close. You know it was the it, it was kind of kind of perfect that way. But uh, I remember I because the the main role that I read throughout the auditions was Dallas. Oh wow! And yeah, so and I and and you know I had a, I had a like big afro, and so this is the eighties. Got to you know I mean I was looking good. Yeah, I had a big afro and everything. And when they flew me out to New York, they 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 cut my hair and greased it back, and you know gave me a leather jacket. You know I'm looking cool, and I'm and I'm I'm in New York, and I'm you know I've been putting a lot of time in. I'm going. I'm so close. This is close, man. I'm, I'm, this could happen. And then I turn and in through the door walked Matt Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess I can just go home now. Cause I mean, he was, I, I, he was not super well known, but I knew him from over the edge and a couple things. And he was just such a charismatic, handsome gentleman. I was like, Oh, okay, well I'm, I'm done. But, uh, it was really, it was a wonderful time. And I, what they did, uh, the last step, the last stage of it was they gathered us around uh, a table in a recording studio and they had two people for each role. And so it was myself and Matt and, you know, it was all these different people and uh, ultimately all the people that, that got the roles as well. And they recorded the whole script. We read through the whole script. Each person would read a half of the script. And what we found out later was uh, Francis was actually doing a kind of like animated storyboard using the voices and things like that. So he was really, you know, again, this is 1982. So he was really cutting edge as far as videotaping and stuff like that. So it was, it was, it was a wonderful, the, the audition, I, I, I haven't experienced anything like that since. And I, and I do really think that's why, you know, you got Tom Cruise and Emilio Estevez and Rob Lowe and, you know, see Thomas Howell and Ralph Macchio, you got all these people. And, and I think that the only way they really put a cast like that together was by work, you know, really working it. It wasn't five minutes in the room, you know, which is, was great. But so as far as the, the, you know, this is how you do it. This is how you get discovered. I would say just, just offer rides to everybody. Before the <laughs> That's really all I got. That's just really be a I great got. Uber. Like all for all our Uber yeah, drivers exactly. out there. This is, it was, an, it, I was an Uber talent. You missed exactly. you missed that uh, that boat. You could have invested in Uber back in the day. <laughs> well, the, the thing, I was the original guy. I was yeah. it. I just didn't know how to monetize. The, ah. the thing you're leaving out, Darren, though, that you didn't accidentally have was talent and ability and charisma and all that wonderful stuff that they noticed when you walked in. Well, He's the Afro. It, uh, he wrote I, that for me. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I, I listen. I, I I had been acting. You know, I was. I was uh, really kind of firmly uh, had my view towards going to New York to be an actor because I, I loved doing stage work so much, you know, and it's like and, and it's it really when I think about this and you and I, Dave, have talked a little bit about this. One of the things that kind of pushed me away from acting is and, and, and when I look back at that time, I can see it so clearly is I was really it was a playground. You know what I mean? I was really having fun. Man, I was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't work. It was, and, and those first few movies, you know, I mean, Red Dawn, you're, you know, playing an army and, you know, doing, I was doing Westerns and you're doing these things that it's just really fun. As soon as I kind of like started taking myself too seriously and it was my own fault, you know, it just started, it, the, the shine came off it a little bit, you know, but when you're young like that too, you'll just, you'll just go in there and, and be yourself and kind of, you know not be so self-conscious and things it was it was it was a it was a really golden time but but i also gotta yeah. say i was being guided by great people because you know coppola obviously he is just a, a master at kind of making you feel comfortable my, making you you know letting you know that you know this is this is the moment right now for you to just do whatever you need to do because there's always going to be another moment afterwards just do your thing and was... so he, he he was able to get that out, which is that's that's important too. I was going to ask: uh, is in the Outsiders? Is that where your friendship with C. Thomas Howell began, or did you know him before? I 
hated him in The Outsider. <laughs> he was he was fourteen. Of course, I hated him. <laughs> he was just somebody who ever I ran into him every once in a while at the craft service truck, and he always wanted the cereal that I wanted. You know what I mean? We'd steal the little box <laughs> of cereal, take it back to our trailer, and I'm like, dude, those Fruit Loops are mine. You know what I mean? They don't make that many Apple Jacks. I need them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I, but the, but ultimately, the thing about it is, is he worked so much on the outsiders that I, unless I was drowning him in a fountain, I didn't really see him that much, <laughs> you know, because I was supposed to be, we, he and I were the only ones that were supposed to go to school during the time. And I was, I was being schooled by myself because he was just constantly working. So we, we, we got along, we were cool with each other, but we really didn't like hit it off and become uh, really good friends until Red Dawn. And, uh, you know, it was funny because I remember you know, we did the film and we did we did the outsiders. I saw him, of course, at the premieres and a couple things like that. But then, when I got cast in Red Dawn, which was also a pretty interesting casting situation, as far as it wasn't just your five minutes in the room. And I I, I we I got the role and, and I'm I'm going to get on the plane to go to uh, to go back to New Mexico to do it. And I co I go into you know, LAX and spread out across like five chairs with his head and. Kyle Richards' lap, who was his girlfriend at the time, was D. Thomas. And it was like, he that just was, I always look back at that moment because that's so perfectly him. He's just this cocky little, I don't know what we can say on this. Is this is this going to be broadcast to children? Uh, he, there, there will be uh, families that listen to it, but you can, I won't <laughs> limit language. He was a cocky guy. He, he was a cocky guy. He was, uh, but, but we, we kind of hit it off right away then. He and I, and Charlie Sheen became kind of the three musketeers on Red Dawn, and that's really where we made the friendship. And, you know, I mean, he and I have been friends for a long time, We're really good friends, roommates. Uh, you know, we've, we've worked together a lot, and, and he's a great guy. We've, we've, he's, he's a brother to me. It's funny. I, I, I heard a wow when you mentioned hanging out with Charlie Sheen, too. And Braden, I heard this right. wow. Well, I was like, well, he's got lunch with him tomorrow. Is he st- I mean, you guys are still yeah. friends, right? You get That's not something yeah. that just was short lived during a movie and, hey, we'll, you know, like no. summer camp, let's, we'll be friends forever. And then you never see each other. It's, it's, a, it's friendships that have. Standard in the movie business yeah. right? for, for, for a lot of it, really. You know, you become such close families and things like that. And then suddenly you're just ripped apart. But. No, you know the and and the other thing, like I see I see Ralph every once in a while, you know, at events, and and you know I'll run into Rob and I, I, all all those guys. I you know I used to run into to Swayze all the time too, and it's just like all those guys were really close, and and uh, maybe because we were so young and we kind of grew up together that you know it became a little bit of a stronger bond. It was it was before we were all completely jaded, right. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, but no, it's it's a it's a good group of people, and and like I said, Tommy and Charlie and I have always been kind of, we were we were actually accused of being a clique during <laughs> Red Dawn, huh. and so I, I don't know I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's that's what that's what I think Patrick called us a clique, and so uh, did he feel that we did he feel left out? Patrick was like, I want you guys to Swayze's be a little older than you guys, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he Patrick, you know the thing is, is Patrick who and and, and listen. But he's one of the best guys, was one of the best people in the world, right? But he took it so seriously, and he really wanted to be Jed. He wanted to be the the leader, you know, and he and, and so he had these three kind of younger dudes that were like, yeah, you do your thing over there giving orders. We're going to be over here, you know, making models. We made a lot of model planes. I think it was the glue and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But, you know, it was like we just – we we just were so close; it was a little harder for him to deal with. But it's nice; it, it created it created color and flavor. I thought, I thought that that was another cast that just came together really well. Do you think because you guys were so young, that was what drove you guys to be so close, or is it kind of the same with as you get older? When you get in older films, that you still for, form those same bonds that you did when you were when you were younger. You, you do, you know, you do. But the thing about it is, when you get older. You got family, you got, you know, you got responsibilities and you got all that stuff that kind of, you know, you're carrying around a bit more of a backpack. You know, when you're young, it's you're still in that place where, you know, you're getting you're, you're getting in trouble together and you're just kind of hanging out. And there's, there's a lot of that. So it's, it's easier you, to form that bond, I think. And you get older and, there, and you start to develop a technique, too. I notice that I, I go in and even though I feel like I'm doing better work now that I'm older, uh, fuller, maybe more layered work. The rawness isn't there anymore. That 
you know, right. that we're bleeding together and really discovering this right. this make believe world is becoming real right before our eyes, and those kind of relationships are just like my some of my high school friends. Even though I don't see many of them very often, that they're still so so special because we went through what you just right. described, Aaron. Just life together, and and then make believe life is. Why is that too, D? Why is that? Because is that because we're like, uh, you know, that we're 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 really like we're bringing on the experience when we're younger. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like we're kind of, we'll go so deeply into the experience. You know what I mean? Like, like you look at Red Dawn as an experience. We were, you know, laying in our trailer, listening to the doors and, you know, and the <laughs> Apocalypse Now soundtrack in the dark. And, you know, we were, yeah. we were really kind of, uh, you know, calling out the muse. You know what I mean? And I don't know, when you get older, sometimes I think, whether it's because maybe you're, you feel like you're going to, you know, it's not going to look good on you or whatever, then you might kind of take a step back and go, no, I'm cool, man. I'm cool. Well, I just, you know, you, I'll do this. You said it earlier, though. You, you, you get to live in the make believe world full time back then when life's responsibilities yep. catch up. And, you know, I, I wouldn't give up my kids for the world, but there have been times Daniela was on set with us on the land that time forgot. And there, there was a time I remember uh, running f- from a dinosaur and, and living in that make-believe world and got back to the trailer and Shalise had a situation going on and handed me my daughter and said, I need you to change the diaper while I go do this. <laughs> and and I wouldn't give that experience up either. But that, You were ready to go back to the dinosaur. Like, give me the dinosaur. <laughs> right, but when we were young, you were you were in that make-believe world, that magic time that Jack Lemmon used to call it, magic time. Right. You were in it 24-7 yeah. until the they playground. said go that's what, you know, the that's playground. What I, that's what I've been thinking lately, too. It's the, it's the playground, and when it's... When it stops being the playground, and uh, then I think that you got to kind of reassess and look back and go, well, how, yeah. how can it be? Because it, 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 you know, you look at it and you go, having having worked a multitude of jobs since then too, you you just you just go, this is the luckiest, coolest job anybody could possibly have ever. Why, you know, and the inevitable uh, rejection that is part of the job is is really it's. It, it, it affects you, and when you get a little bit older and you get a little distance, you realize, listen, that's part of it for everybody. Yeah. You know, Brad Pitt is is picking up the phone and hearing, well, they went with somebody else. Right. You know, it's like everybody's hearing that. So it's it's just kind of part of it. And and if that starts to take the shine off it, whatever it is that starts to take the shine off of it, you got to step away and go, kind of get back to that magic that you felt when you first stepped out on stage, and you heard all those people breathing out there in the audience. You know, and you had the first line, and you and you gave that first line, and suddenly you were like, "Whoo!" You, you know, you're off, and and you're, yeah. you know, you're fighting the, you know, you're fighting the Capulets because you know those freaking Capulets need to be need <laughs> to be fought. So it's like you, you just you just kind of there, you know. It's, well, you know, it's, I it's, it's, it's I just I there. just did that. You know this, but just last year, I I was I started really getting negative about showing up yeah. on set and feeling like like it wasn't any fun. I didn't want to be there. I'd rather go drive my big rig. Then be on a movie set, and I not only turned down auditions, but I turned down offers because I didn't want to right. be there. And I really needed to find out what we're talking about right now. What 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 have I lost? What did I used to have that made this yeah. so special and precious? Because that's when you're doing your best work, at least as an actor. That's you know where, where the bulk right. of my experience is. And and I gave it up long enough to 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 realize that it wasn't something I could live without. And and you know, two or yeah. two or three other. Well, and experience is the key word there, right? Because what is what experience do you want to have? Like, I'm always blown away by the people when they say, "Oh, yeah, so and so who's been on this series for eight years," you know, like shove somebody. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait a second, you you've been on a series for eight years, and you're not like, you know, if I'm on a series for eight years, I'm buying everybody flowers every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, well, hopefully, but, cars but by eight not, year eight. Right. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, yeah, it's Game of Thrones it's territory. Flowers, it was going to be a lot of. It was going to be a lot of flowers. But uh, um, I'm just saying, you know, it's it's you can forget that. You can lose sight of that. I think you can do that with anything. Let me certainly let, with any art form. The, the, on this topic, but it, but but to, but to move along to 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 a question I've been wanting to ask anyway. Um, 
Be, the the way you describe is it okay? Is it my turn? Ready? You don't, you, I know you've got. Go ahead. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> you've I'm got an, this agenda. I, I am in awe right now, like learning and just kind of feeding. Like I think that's Emily Tamby and I are just kind of sitting here learning. So go ahead, take it. Well, I, I feel like if uh, I'm a little selfish because I get to have conversations with Darren like this all the time. So I want to make sure I ask <laughs> the questions that when I ask, I shut up and listen to him. Like, tell me this one. Tell me this story again, Darren. Of course. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I. The, the way you described being on the outsiders and even from the audition process and the amount of time and I, I think I already know the answer, but I'd like to hear and then maybe I'm imagining it. I just I just had the chance to watch uh, the outsiders and Red Dawn back to back over the course of less than 48 hours. Right. And as an actor, I think I noticed I mean, Red Dawn is I'm looking at it right here, eighty seven percent loved, you know, this movie, it's it's a classic. There's almost nobody who doesn't like the original Red Dawn. It's iconic. And and, and what yeah, I I'm, get people all the time that come up to me and say, That could happen, dude. Could happen. <laughs> and, and, and and what I'm saying it's is not that I didn't also love the movie, but I, I as an actor I watched them back to back and there was to me on the outsiders, there was a there was a camaraderie, a leaning on, a, a, a groundedness, a connectedness yeah. that 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 every single actor in the show had found. That it was manicured, yeah. it was it was developed, it was it was coddled. And I thought that yeah. that that, be, that that up next to Red Dawn, there was something, and, and maybe you can enlighten us, something that that didn't happen, maybe or did happen on Red Dawn, that didn't allow you guys that opportunity. The 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 level of groundedness, I think, maybe is you'll never find it almost anywhere else that you found in The Outsiders. So maybe it's just because right. that one was so special. But yeah, and the material itself, you know, and the the reality of it, you know, because if you stop and think about it, you know, like I said, people come up and say that could happen, but you know, Red Dawn's pretty far out there. You know what I mean? So it's, you're, you're not, and, and it's, it's fun in a different way, but, but first off, again, both of those uh, had six to eight weeks of rehearsal, but, but it all, it all spins out from the person at the, at the wheel, you know, because Coppola and Milius are, even though they're kind of from the same school are completely different people, you know, and completely different directors because when we're going and we're doing the two months of rehearsal for outsiders, we're, we're, you know, we're exploring the character when we're going and doing the eight weeks at, for red Dawn, we're learning to field strip an AK 47 blindfold. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? It's, it's a different ball game. So both of them kind of tap into a different thing, but, but I, 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 I I don't know that there's been like something that that people you know that listen I go I go to places uh, that celebrate the outsiders now wow. right I mean it's like what 35 years later or something like that and so. people are still so strongly into it you know and things that it's it's a it it blows my mind how how uh, I I know that for me I kind of felt you know I kind of felt that it was something special you know what I mean? Right. And Red Dawn was fun, but it wasn't like that. You know, the, outs the Outsiders felt like this was, this is very special. Uh, Darren, I was, a lot of my generation, I, I want to believe, kind of missed the, the Swayze kind of renaissance of his movies. And yeah. uh, I was just uh, curious to see what, what, it, what it's like working with a character like Swayze. And a person like that, that level, that level, level yeah. of talent. Well, and you know, and and doing it right there within the within the short period of time, you know, within a couple of years to do a couple of bigger projects with him was fantastic. He was, he was, he was a big brother. Um, you know, Tommy did, I think, three movies right there in a row with him because he did Grandview USA in the middle of that. And uh, um, Buddy was a really special guy. He was in, he was uber talented on every level. Like anything that you did, you know, you could be you could say, oh, we're playing tiddlywinks today, and 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 Patrick would be like, oh yeah, I I, I did that in the in the Olympics, <laughs> and and he and he was and he was he did you know, but great horse horseman and you know, but just a really special loving 
guy, and uh, and I, I, he was one of those people I really loved seeing afterwards. I remember what one one meeting so distinctly because we met, we you know, as you so often do, we we kind of ran into each other in the hallways, and of an audition, and he said, "Oh, bro, you got to come out and check check out my new car." And so he takes me out after the audition, and we go around the corner, and there he's got his new DeLorean. <laughs> and I was, and, wow. and it was like that was, you know, that this was Dirty Dancing era. This is like right around in that time, and it, and and it just really, to, I remember looking at it and going, "Wow, Pat, Patrick has arrived. This is it." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, even though it was the, our generation's Edsel, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was it was cool. But Buddy was just a really a really great guy, and and it was very much demonstrated. When he passed, and we went to his, uh, to his, he had a, a, a memorial that was amazing because it was on the back lot at Sony. Um, he had he had written a book about his life, and he had recorded the audio version prior to his death. And so the memorial was very special because there were great people there that had gathered together to celebrate him. But, you know, Whoopi Goldberg would get up and say something, and then they'd play a, an, uh, an excerpt from the audio book of Patrick talking about his own life and show them the pictures. And and then, so, you know, and then somebody else would get up and Jennifer Grey would get up and stuff. It was just a really special time, but you could really see, you know, the gathering of people that was there and how 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 much he was missed and things like that. He was just a really, really wonderful guy. He really was. And, you know, ultra competitive, you know, and sometimes that, at least at that point when you're younger, that, that can be really fun. You know, when I'm, when he and I are fighting in Red Dawn and stuff like that, you're, you know, you do have a competitive aspect that comes in there and stuff. So really great guy. Great guy. I had the pleasure of watching Red Dawn for the first time this, this weekend, the the original one, my sister and I back in, I, I believe in 2012, we went and saw Red Dawn, the remake. So it was kind of right. curious to see how much they took from your movie to and changed it up, but also with Patrick Swayze's character with Chris Hemsworth. So I yeah. was just curious, when they announced that they were making Red Dawn uh, again, did they reach out to you? Did you uh, reach out to the character that was playing you, the actor that was playing you? Did you give them any Which tips? Which was Tom Cruise's son, right? It was Tom Cruise's kid that played the, the role that I played. I, but, uh, but, but I... To, to be honest, and I, 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 I know I threw rocks at it earlier, but I didn't. I never saw it. I've never seen it. Oh. I mean, it was. It just. It just seems wrong to me to go see it. You know, and and uh, I mean, obviously, if somebody come up and said it was, you know, that was really good, that I might have gotten there. You know, might, might have. I might have uh, worked to get there to see it. But um, it. It. They didn't reach out to me. Huh. And is, I was like, I, I, Tom I, I, I'm like, I already know how to use the machine gun. <laughs> do you still know how to detach and uh rebuild an AK47? Oh, I I'm sure if we if I had it for 10 minutes we we I'd be okay. I I'm sure I could probably mess it up pretty well. So what you're but, saying uh, um, is yeah. if in that situation uh, World War War 3 we come find you and we should be come safe for a little place. while. Well, at least for a second so we realize <laughs> that, you know. Well, we you know we get, listen we got to do a lot of really cool stuff on that movie. We got to shoot the real guns at one point in training and, and when you're firing all those blanks and you're running around and you know, it was bitter cold and I have, I, I have boots somewhere that I wore in the movie and the, there are grill marks in the, in the bottom of the boots from just, I was just standing on the fire, wow. you know? And, and it was like, it was cold. It's so cold that it, during the death scene, um, during the death, my death scene on top of that butte, the, the squibs kept uh, freezing up. Oh no! <laughs> so they would, yeah, they would, they would shoot me, and no blood would come out. It was just you know, a little bit of ice. So they had to, you know, they'd have a couple people with the hair dryers, you know, standing there uh, melting the squibs until they said action. But, but uh, there were a couple of uh, experiences on that movie that were kind of those transcendent experience that, experiences that you have uh, as an actor. And a lot of that was, again, was Milius just kind of setting up this hyper reality of it, the spider hole ambush. If you remember that scene, you know, when they come through and we, we jump out of the spider holes, uh, he put us down in those spider holes for a long time oh, no. before they actually rolled and shot. And uh, like we were waiting, you know, and so you kind of get this, you get this sense that builds up in you, this 
dread, this something. And then the, then the wild thing about it, and this is what's crazy about movies, you know, and you don't get this enough because when I was a kid, I wanted this to, this is the way I wanted movies to be. I wanted them not to stay cut and it just to continue. Uh, but the, the, the wild thing is, is you would throw the, you know, you had a very choreographed, uh, you know, target. So they, you'd throw the, the cover off and then you, you know, Milius would come up and say, okay, so, you know, once in each leg and then strafe the body. And you'd be like, so you go, pow, 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 pow. And you'd see this, and the, the squibs would pop, and the guy would fall down. And you'd have, like, this, you know, kind of moment of, whoa, this is, you know, it would, it would be a very heavy, heavy moment. And when, uh, when we were shooting the death scene on the top of the, of the mountain there, it was, it was a moment where, you know, everybody's there. And the whole thing goes down. I get shot. I fall down. You know, I just had basically my best friend just shot me. I fall down on the ground. And in order to kind of help me a little bit, Milius said, listen, fall so that you're facing away from the camera because you're going to be there a while. So we don't want to see your breath and things because it's really cold. So I fall with my face away from the camera and they're doing the whole thing. You know, Patrick's coming up and crying and, you know, and everybody's pointing and crying and hugging and whatever and then riding off and i had this moment i could see them riding away and i had this moment in my head where i it took everything i could not to jump up and make sure that there were cameras behind me because i had talked myself into this so deeply that i was like my people are leaving me and i'm you know i'm here so when they said when i finally somebody did say cut i was just this relief came over me that it was, it was an interesting moment. And again, that's, you know, Dave, that's what we're talking about. That yeah. youthfulness, that, that, you know, that, that, uh, what do they call it? The willing suspension of disbelief that you're asking from the audience. You got to have that even more so from the actor. Right. I, I know, call because it because that's when make yeah. believe you, you have, you, if you make exactly. yourself believe you start by you believing then everyone else who's, who gets to watch the show will, will, will follow along and believe you as well. And that, and that's when things that's when stuff comes through that you you know that you that that surprises you and that and you know the outsiders is one of the best examples of accidents happening on film that all of them are kept in there you know that was and and I remember Coppola really pushing for that I remember one time Leif Garrett said cut himself like I don't know what happened is something the, he dropped the flask of whiskey or something like that. And he said, cut. And Francis went nuts and said, <laughs> you never, never cut the scene. I cut the scene. You go and stuff. And so and when you look at that movie, there's, you know, there's Matt Dillon's chair falling over in the in the, <laughs> the drive in. You know, there's there's a there's a hat blowing through the frame that Emilio picks up and puts on. Such a great moment. Hat. I love it's him. a great moment. Yeah. yeah. All those all that stuff, you know, so it's, it was it was it was again, a great place to get your first taste of what it is because you just, it, it was having fun. It was make-believe. It, it really was. And and when you got make-believe on that level, you're a really lucky person to be there. And Darren, I don't want to keep you for too long. We have you for a few more minutes before you got to go teach the youth. But we, we, We'll get him back. Yeah. There's there's a whole list of things we can ask him about. His relationship with the who's who of Hollywood. He, he, you know, he could call Jack Nicholson and Jack Nicholson would take his call. Wow. He knows Keanu. <laughs> he could talk about Keanu as a young... We could get him going about all kinds of wonderful topics, but before you get to the end of, of getting to talk to him, I, I, I was curious, knowing that you got to behave in this environment that we've been talking about for, for the, I guess, about a half an hour now, I, I know you transitioned. I know you still act, and, and we've been on a, on a few uh, movie sets recently, and I know you still do it, yep. but I, I know your love moved. Uh, uh, f- that, that That's not your central creative yep. outlet. Uh, what, what led you from being in the prime of your life, in, in, in the epicenter of the acting world, to following your... Your calling as a as a as a writer. Well, it was because because writing was always my playground. You know that was always the place where, you know, it, it, it writing is a wonderful thing too because you can you know, you can wake up you, as an actor you can't wake up in the middle in the middle of the night and go I'm going to play Hamlet, but you can write you can say I'm going to you can wake up in the middle of the night and say I'm going to write it. And you can go upstairs and you can start. You know what I mean? It was like there just wasn't I, it, I I don't think that acting was a large enough outlet for the storyteller that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to embrace, you know, and writing, 
writing really does that. And, uh, and it's interesting because now that I'm teaching it too, you know, especially to these younger people, then you realize just kind of how esoteric it is and how, you know, how now that I'm teaching it, I realize this is almost something that can't be taught. And, uh, uh, it, 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 it's just, it's just, I love it. I mean, you, you know, the heart wants, wants what the heart wants. Is that what it, is that the saying? Yeah. Because you just, you, you, it's, it's always what I was drawn to. Um, you know, if somebody said to me, okay, you can, you can stand in front of the cameras and do this, or you can go into your little room and do that. Then I would be in the little room, you know? And, uh, and, and so that's, I think that that's, that was one of the things that kind of just took me over as well. It was, uh, as far as writing and directing was just wanting to be wanting to be involved a little bit more on a on a larger level I call know, which which uh, yeah. I, I call Darren the machine <laughs> he will regularly <laughs> send me an email that has an entire draft of a anywhere from 90 to 120 page screenplay he'll send it to me and then call me up hey did you get a chance to read it and I'll just be a day or two later getting a chance to finish it another email will pop in a new draft of a new movie with a completely different topic. <laughs> hey, did you get a chance to read? And it's always like that. He's always at his chair. Well, when he can, you know, responsibilities as a parent, as a husband, yeah. as a teacher and everything else. But he, I know he loves it because he does it when he has he, – he does it to the point where he'll go tip over in a meeting because he chose writing over sleep. Yeah. And so instead yeah, instead of it. catching his sleep, he'll just finish that chapter. One of my favorite stories that that I got to participate in with Darren, when he was a writer, he called me and said, Dave, and I, I've told this story a hundred times, but it's one of my favorite ones, and I'll tell it really quickly. <laughs> Dave, I'm writing, a, I'm writing a role for you in a movie, The Land That Time Forgot. You're going to be running from dinosaurs, and you're a bomber pilot, and you're lost on this <laughs> island, and then our heroes all show up, and you guide them across the island. And I said, w- wouldn't it be great if, and I, I happen to have a seven-foot-long jungle carpet python as a pet. I said, wouldn't it be cool if, if my character, Jude, had a, had, a, had a python as a buddy? And I heard, now he does. And Joe made it in the movie, and the magic, the power of the writer to simply go, yes, that is now part of the make-believe world we are creating, just by a few strokes of the keys, added that element to this magic world. Wow. Of course I love it. How can you not love that? That's a. That's awesome. That's, uh, I'm, I remember Dave, when I was younger, he used to terrorize with that snake, so now it's funny yeah. that the, <laughs> the snake is a movie star now. Uh, Darren, right. I see uh, we've kind of run all of our time up with you. I just wanted to say an incredible thank you to hopping yeah. on this podcast. It means a lot to me. And to yeah, invite me again, I'd love to come on. I'd love to, you know, I can, and I could talk movies all day. I talked to me all, this whole time, and that's, you know, that's well, come on, that's boring. Let's talk movies. Let's I will it. be happy to have you on anytime. You I were, was not bored at all. Yeah, we all sat here and just listened. I have a lot of questions about Charlie Sheen <laughs> and all that, so I'll, I'll be happy. To, we might we might want to wait till this is, you know, the, the kids aren't listening. <laughs> of course, we'll have an after hours episode. <laughs> That's uh, exactly what you need behind the yeah exactly exactly when the camera stopped rolling is uh because he's a character and 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 you know every bit is as funny and things as you as you see on on screen I'm looking forward to seeing him awesome well I enjoy your class teach well and uh, we thank look you. forward to hearing you from you soon thank you yeah thank you guys thank you everybody thanks Darren Tammy want to say thank you all right buddy okay thank you <laughs> teach thank those you. children well brother <laughs> I will. I'll see you guys soon. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Wow. That was like a, a like a few granules of sand in like <laughs> the desert of fun conversations we could have with him. He's but, he's one of the most loved people I've ever been mm-hmm. around. People anybody who's met him, worked with him, been cared for by him that there's almost there's almost well there never I've never met anyone who didn't have kind words to say and, and felt very loved by him and and had a great love and respect for him. I have very few moments in my young career of just like like wow that that actually happened. Um the first one that comes to my mind is being able to like stand in front of and interview LeBron James when I was doing my sports stuff. Sweet. Uh so that was a moment that I kind of really was just like whoa. And then after and then at the end at the end of this interview it was just one of those moments where like 
wow, like something that I've created has kind of spawned into this thing where I'm able to, on this platform, uh, lucky enough to talk to these people that and share their stories. So that was really cool for me. Thank you, Dave, for bringing him on. That was an awesome opportunity, and he's an awesome guy, and I yeah. look forward to hearing from and hearing from him in the future. When he, and he meant it when he said he he you know he'd be back on you know he let give him the homework and let instead of movies that he's been a part of let let let's get his take on movies that he's not. You oh, know, perfect. And join in that kind of the conversation. I know you guys have that pretty regular. So. Oh yeah, and uh, we have those flashback movie reviews. The kind of we. Did a little bit different this week. We kind of bed it into the interview, which I actually really enjoyed. When we have those special guests, I think that's the way we should go about it is have movies that tie into who we're bringing on so we can like talk to them about it. So that was really cool. Uh, to kind of segue, I want to throw back to our first episode that we ever did. There was a uh, – Jim and I went and saw us back back on episode one of the movie hour – we talked about... <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what's coming. This is I, amazing. We talked about this guy who <laughs> nearly sent Jim into a panic attack. Uh-huh. He farted throughout the entire movie. He would dig around in his big popcorn bowl for kernels that were, weren't there. And they were just, there. He would just move them around. <laughs> exactly. And he had this big tub of some soda and just like would slurp on it in the entire movie. And comment throughout throughout the throughout the movie. Mm, just say weird uh. comments. Hmm, oh, that was really cool. <laughs> so, Dave and I had the pleasure of going to the early screening of John Wick yesterday. John Wick three. John Wick three. Parabellum, and we get there. I had two gripes with this movie. The first gripe is that we had to sit in the front row. The front row was kind of oh, it was, it was so rough. Hard. It was if rough. we would have been hard. one inch closer, it would have been unwatchable. It was, but still, yeah. it was, it you was had still to good time. Choose what part of the screen to look at. Exactly. <laughs> and then the second issue is the same no. guy yep. no. sat next oh, to me. No. <laughs> the odds, the, the, go- odds. <laughs> the gods hate me or something because literally, I remember sitting there. Dave and I got there fairly early, and we just kind of sat there. And we're like, "Wow, we're sitting in the front row, man. We just nobody likes us yet." <laughs> so we're just sitting there, and they're like, all VIP tickets, huh, Braden? <laughs> <laughs> and they said <laughs> VIP on them. So, and we got we got there, and then all of a sudden, I see this guy kind of mosey his way to the front. I was like, "Oh no, he's don't sit next to me. Please be in the wrong seat, wrong wrong place." He and, was originally he and his the guy he came with. Were I think us. they were supposed to, and they, but they got kicked out because yeah. the people who really they had those pissed. tickets, <laughs> they were they mad. weren't very friendly about no, it. No, they were yeah. not. And he sits next to us, and he does the exact same thing as he did throughout the throughout us. And like it was so hard to like pay attention. He smelled really bad, and like he had audible comments on like everything, and just like it's like wow, that's really hot. Or like, yeah, it was from that angle. I was just like no, um, so. Uh, it was just one of those moments where I was <laughs> oh like, I, I leaned over to Dave in the middle of the movie, and I was like, Dave, rem- remember that time where Jim like nearly had a panic attack and, and at us, and we talked about this story about this guy that just kind of was not should not have been there. This is him. <laughs> well, and I wanted to say actually two things about that. One is it's probably it's probably a great thing that Jim chose. Uh, a few days or a week ago, whenever it was, when he made his decision to finally ask for some help and, and get real serious medical help for his condition, which, by the way, I'm really, really proud of Jim for yeah, doing we that. Are. We, I mean, it's it's it, maybe the analogy is, is has been used before, but if you break your leg and the bone is you know out of the skin, the compound fracture, and you look down, it's pretty obvious for everyone around to go, you better go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. But when but when the condition, which is uh, Every bit as severe in a different way is is so difficult for anyone to see except him and his own head and mm-hmm. and what he's experiencing. For for him to ask for help, he's such a uh, an obstinate, uh, stubborn young man. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. him to really ask for help, and for his friend BJ to say, "Yeah, let's get you help," and for then several of us who love him around in, in his in his inner circle to take steps to immediately get him help, and for it to still be happening that he's in there getting. The, the help that he needs. I'm, I'm very, very proud of him for that. Yeah. And, and I'm thankful that you guys have let me step in for him in the meantime while he, he, he takes the much-needed care of, of, of himself. And, and the second thing, I guess, is just the anecdote of, it's not an anecdote, it's just, just kind of something silly to say that uh, it's a good thing he went in last week because <laughs> if last week didn't get him, 
<laughs> Sitting yesterday. by that guy again. That would have got him. Yeah. He would have lost it. He, he told me in <laughs> us. Think he he wouldn't have made he it. He told me in us that he nearly like left. And I'm guarantee he would have left during John Wick 3. But oh, yeah. to yeah. talk about John Wick 3 a little bit, to kind of go off a little bit, I've seen the other two. I love the other two. Dave has not seen them. So I was curious. And I told him not to go see it just to kind of get a different perspective of people that oh, haven't yeah, seen the fresh. third one. And uh, the the first two to see if that kind of sways their opinion on the movie. Dave, I want to hear what you have to say about John Wick three first, and then I'll give mine after that. Interestingly, I I went years ago. I went to watch John Wick one on demand. I was really excited. Heard great things about it. This wonderful, amazing action movie. And I've always liked Keanu and and he's his, the range of this guy. You know, um, uh, he, and I and I watched. I knew I only had a few minutes, so I popped it on to the to the on demand on the big screen TV, and I watched about fifteen minutes. Of, of Wick 1 and had to go on to, to whatever I was doing, maybe sleep. And very next day I was going to finish the movie and it was no longer on demand. <laughs> Sometime later I was like, I'm, I'm going to see if John Wick is back on demand and found, no, it's not, but but number two is. Oh, what the heck, I'll watch number two. I only got a few minutes. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start it. I started it and didn't get back to it for another week or two. And lo and behold, I went to watch that one again and it was off demand. <laughs> and I guess maybe that's me being cheap, but I didn't, you know, order the the pay version of it. And so then circle all the way down the road to where you said, let's go see John Wick 3. So I had a real basic, limited working knowledge of of the dog. Yeah. And I knew that that, that was a big deal in the story and his wife. And, and that's about the extent of the storyline. Watching all of number three, that that's the one piece that I missed. Is I like to be part of the tale. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite things about movies, when they, whether they're you know action or adventure or whatever they are, I like to be part of the tale, the story, the that that carries the the, the momentum of the scene. And I, and I could tell I was in the dark mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Uh, so I'm, I, I, as a standalone movie, I missed some elements that I, I just wish I was privy to, and I would have wanted to have seen mm-hmm. one and two. Are you looking at your watch like, come on, Dave, shorten no, up your answer. No, I get notifications <laughs> telling me to, to stand up every get now and then. Get it going. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, as far as like the, the standalone value of the movie itself, after you said it, you leaned over after 10 minutes and was like, that was only 10 minutes. <laughs> and we had just been taking on, taking on this adventure, this action ride. And I don't know if it was halfway through. It was about halfway through, maybe three quarters the way through. All I wanted was for John to get a nap and a sandwich. (laughs) I've kept, I was so exhausted. I wanted a nap and a sandwich. I was so exhausted watching Keanu Reeves constantly battling for his life. It exhausted me to see him working so hard. I, it, it, it. I don't know if the movie was too long. I wouldn't say that it is. It was too long for me because I need to watch that in two parts. I needed a break in the middle. I needed a nap and a sandwich before I could finish it. <laughs> That's a good point because I thought the first like the first two acts probably the best that John Wick Amazing. is. Amazing. The best at it like it, at its best. It's I still think John Wick 1's my favorite. This one is right behind it though, but John Wick 3, the first two acts constantly going. There's you could barely take a breath, but once you do hit that breath, I feel like it it took a little while to get back going to close out the third act. And the third act kind of seemed like it it was there was like two or three different endings. Like I was like, okay, here's the end. Oh wait, no, no, here's the end. And then it finally ended. And I was so I thought the the last probably thirty minutes were it seemed longer than it actually was, but it still was a good time from uh from start to finish. L- leaving the theater, I, w- I was telling Dave like. I would not have assumed that the one thing that I took from the movie would be the cinematography and the and the shots in the movie. There are so many beautifully shot scenes in this movie that it's incredible that I was just like because people are dying in front of me and just amazing action and that's the John Wick series. They're always incredible when it comes to their action sequences. But like I was like kind of looking at the landscape of Morocco or something like that. You just see all the colors on the screen or you're in downtown New York City and it's dark and gloomy but you it's still lit very well and you can see all these things and you're in the middle of the desert and you get like kind of a landscape of of John Wick climbing up on a desert. And and then it cuts to a dark like a a, a night scene in the same desert. And it's just like so many different shots, so many different composition kind of things that the director took time. He didn't need to do it. It's it's an action movie where people just die. It's known for killing the most people in fr- in movie history. 
<laughs> the first one broke the record for most deaths in a movie. The second one topped it. I guarantee the third one did the same thing. So they didn't need to take the extra time to make the the shots look as cinematic as as beautiful as it did. And I they, they didn't need to 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 make it worth the audience's exactly. time. But they did if they wanted to do, which I think they accomplished, is they put masters of the craft in in all the positions. And they let everybody who was great at what they do participate in this epic adventure exactly. uh, action story. Exactly. And John Wick's always done a good job of kind of adding new characters. Dave was telling, asking me, he's like, oh, who are the people from the other movies? And I was like, I think there's only four. There's Ian McShane, there's Keanu Reeves, there's... Um, the bailiff, I forgot his name. I don't. I, and um, Lawrence Fishburne. Those are the four people that were, that are in every single one of the movies. Every everyone else is new, which I have noticed that John Wick does really well is bringing on these new characters and making them stand alone. Like Common was the one last, and John Wick two that stood out for me. He he was awesome. And then Halle Berry and John Wick three, equally as awesome. She was able to stand alone as as her own thing and be a part of the movie and have her own story that she's not like a knockoff John Wick. She had her own way to take out people, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So those dogs, the dogs. dogs. Oh my goodness. The they dogs. have this. No spoilers. There's no dog. I'm just There's, saying the dogs are amazing. <laughs> John Wick has this thing with uh, like the series alone with dogs just are very special. So I love the uh, everything with the dogs. I was very impressed with those dogs. The dog trainers. They, they were a lot of very, very, very talented professionals working on that movie. So we're gonna we have a few more minutes left. Uh, we're gonna talk about what's coming up next next week for people to watch. Um, but this week you should definitely be go- going to see John Wick. I highly suggest going to see it. Uh, but I mean, th- unless you don't like a whole bunch of people dying in front of you, even the, like <laughs> of my family but members that or people that kind of just don't like rated R movies. It is very brutal. It is. There's so many, but like, I want to say there's where to kind of flashback when I saw drive. There's like a, there's a lot of points in that movie where I had to cover my eyes because oh, it was man. so it was so unexpected. grotesque, and it's like oh I can't watch this. Whereas John Wick is in a different different realm where it's exciting at, like violence. Like I was like oh wow like I like my hands like cover over my face and like I like audible like it's like holy cow that was awesome. So like it's a different kind of thing. It's an action, not so much as like terrifyingly violent things. So if if violence is kind of your thing that you just don't like watching, I suggest giving it a try. I think it's worth it. Um, going into next week, we have I have screenings to Aladdin on Tuesday. That's so, gonna be awesome. So yeah. Guy Ritchie's Aladdin, we're going to see it on Tuesday, which is going to be a fun time. I'm exe- uh, exceedingly excited for this. John- Aladdin is my favorite Disney movie, so I'm gonna mine, I'm, mine too. So I'm nervous, but also excited to see it live action. So we'll see how I saw Aladdin when you were a baby. You went with, you and I went together. Your sister took me. With you and Steve and Tambi, I think Tambi wasn't born yet. It was nineteen ninety four. It was just the two I of you. Was not a thought. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so I got to go see Aladdin in the theater for my first time. Your mom took me to see it with you guys. Steve and my mom went and saw Aladdin in the theater twelve times. Wow. Oh my goodness. So there's Steve's plug. There you go, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he always gets one. And gets also one. two other movies that I think people should uh, check out. That I'm. I hope that the AMC uh, by your place that I always go see. Uh, has them is Brightburn with uh, James Gunn. It's basically a take on if Superman became evil when he was a little kid. So it's a, like a, a super powered young horror movie esque of a superhero that just kind of just takes over uh, that. So that one and then Booksmart is supposed to be a really funny. Uh, um, it's like got 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes right now. So. Those those three are those are, are both in theaters right now. They, they, they open next Thursday, oh, okay. so a week from to de- from today when this episode drops. We're gonna do three at once. No, I'm just saying that's those are movies for people to, to look keep out an, for to keep an to eye out on, and then but we're gonna review Aladdin next week. So that one, but like for our movie challenge to lead up into Aladdin, Dave brought up the idea we should tie it into Guy Ritchie who's directing Aladdin. So we're gonna watch Snatch. So I love that. Movie. And then the second one is Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. That was barrels. his very. I also believe very that was his very first film. It was his Sundance debut as Lock, Stock, and Two was, Smoking Barrels. And they're both on Netflix, so you guys are easily able to find it. And yeah, so those are those are our movies, and I guess that's our show. We're actually <laughs> hitting almost an hour to the dot. We got a, we got like a minute left. So this is the first time that we 
kind of run it really close. Um, an well, awesome you, show. You're going to cut some stuff out, aren't you? Oh, no, no. we're keeping. The Everything, entire, stays. Full, Everything stays. Full Everything stays. recording. Everything stays. This is this is a real treat for those in the craft of acting mm-hmm. and even writing. So we didn't it get was a great listen. Exactly, we didn't get much of us, <laughs> our personalities this time. But I don't think that they get that every week. Who cares right. about our personality? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have a very terrible personality, yeah. but it's pretty boring. It's true. She lives <laughs> with me, so she knows. Uh, but I think what we did here was an awesome opportunity, getting Darren's si- uh, story and hearing from him. So I think a lot of people took uh, learned yeah. a lot from that. So that was awesome. Right. And yeah, so go see John Wick three. Uh, to close that out, Tammy, you want to say? Do you want to give your social media out, or you? <laughs> she she doesn't want to. Okay, okay. Emily. Uh, uh, em- Emily Fox SLC on Instagram. It's Emily Fox underscore SLC. And we didn't. We'll we'll dive into it next week a little bit more with Dave because Dave has a an illustrious acting career as well that people are going to want to hear from. But Dave, how do people illustrious find you <laughs> and hear oh, from you? Man, I wish you would have asked me that before now. So I could have, I, you have a Facebook page. I, don't you? I, yeah, I guess David it's at H. David H. Stevens. Stevens. My, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm of the generation, the age, my, I just missed really even given a, <laughs> damn about social media it's it's a fight for me like i like occasionally to go hey hi everybody how's my friends but most of the time i don't pay attention to it i get irritated by it a lot i think i have a twitter account somewhere <laughs> that i maybe have posted three times on but as a professional actor it's a really important element that i keep being told by my representatives that i have to do better at at, at, at spreading the word of, of how to find me there are times for the young actors, just so you guys know this, there are times where I've heard that if, say, Dave and Bill are, it's down to me, it's down to me and Bill for the, for the lead in a new movie, and they love us both, and we're, they, they really can't make a decision, we're both perfect for it, they'll say, well, who has more followers? Hmm. So it's, it is an important element in casting nowadays, too. They want to know, if I say, hey, to my whatever, 50 followers, or what's yeah. a lot of followers, I don't know. Um, 50. 50. That's 50 tickets <laughs> yeah, sold, yeah, right? Yeah. It's probably bigger, oh. probably more than that. No, 50 is the... Like, that would be my, that would be my of number success. of followers. <laughs> pinnacle but of success I, is But if you'll says. ask me again next week, I'll make sure not only that I have found out what my Twitter is, I will, <laughs> I'll ask my, my daughter who's 11 or, or my son who's 7 to help me set up an Instagram. <laughs> And she, she, she may have already. Yeah, Daniel, she's probably using. She's actually, got she's got forty eight followers, have, so she's pushing Instagram. you. Okay, because oh, I follow I follow Danny. So ask me again next week, and I'll have all of that. So and I'll even tweet. Perfect. Yeah. And Tambi, if you want to set up the the closeout real quick. Does the prod need to be on? Is that the thing? Don't don't turn it on until after you open the file. Yeah. Or else so, it'll play on. So you. turn off the prod okay. button, and well, then awesome. and then what? Open the. Okay. Uh, She's figuring that out. But anyway, for those that want that are listening, I really do appreciate you guys listening. If you wouldn't mind giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, leaving us a review on Facebook, because apparently that's a thing now. We've have we have so many followers now on Facebook. Well, we that, can review that they uh, people can review us. We on should Facebook. have gotten Darren's yeah. info too. Yes. Make sure he'll, I'm sure he'll share all this. And or? yes, uh, I'll I'll tag Darren and make sure that he knows. And Dave will give me his information so I can send it out for you guys to follow him and support him and what whatever work he's doing next but yeah follow us on instagram follow us on facebook like us on facebook and then follow us on twitter it our twitter is kind of a is struggling right now so but don't worry about it as much but youtube we, we're pretty good on youtube and instagram and facebook so those are the three that i would suggest checking us out on tammy do you have that ready it's not working it's not working Oh well. I don't Speaking think it's struggling. I can sing it to you. No. <laughs> it's okay. I can put it in post production because right now if you hear it, right now it's actually me doing it in post. So anyway, thank you guys and I'll see you all next week. Hours not enough. <laughs>